Okay. All right. So we have a message from our curator first. We have to talk in two different mics so that the recording hears us and then Zoom people hear us. So, okay. Oh, hello there. Hello from Centrum, Port Townsend, Washington. My name is Maximiliano, and I am the curator for this time, a watershed graphic novel series exhibition by Melanie Stevens. I'm really bummed I can't be there in person, but I'm really excited for this artist talk, and I know it'll be a lot of fun. Working with Melanie was a complete delight, and her artwork's amazing, and you should definitely check out the show. It's open till October 17th. Watershed Volume 1 and Volume 2 are currently out now, and if you don't have a copy, you should definitely buy them. And I can't wait for the third volume to come out. I've already read the first two several times. Melanie is a delight, an amazing artist, and I can't wait for all the things Melanie's going to do in the future. And I know today is going to be a lot of fun. First, I'd like to thank Jen Cole and PNCA for all that they've done to help with this show. And definitely shout out Hannah Bakken for all her work and help and support. I would also like to thank Melanie Stevens, of course, and Erne Winham for his work installing the show. He's super excellent and you should hire him for all your art install needs. Also shout out the moderator, Vo, who I know is gonna do an amazing job today, and the panelists, Shreda Town and Sam Saxby. I know it's gonna be a great conversation. And I'm really looking forward to all of it. Also shout out the Media Tech team for all they're doing and all their support. And I know Hannah Blockwin will continue the rest of it. So I will leave you in Hannah's very capable hands. Enjoy, bon appetit. Okay, so I'm gonna come into the recording area and do my intro and loom over Melanie here. All right, so we acknowledge that the land where PNCA is located rests on the traditional sites of the Multnomah, Calthamet, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, Bands of the Chinook, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. We also acknowledge the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous Native American families today. As settlers and guests on these lands, we respect the work of Native nations, leaders, and families, and make ongoing efforts to center indigenous knowledge, creativity, resilience, and resistance. Land acknowledgments such as this official PNCA script can certainly be a first step in understanding the histories and colonial forces that have both displaced and brought many to reside on this land. But it must not be the only or the last step. Acknowledgements without action do not actively address ongoing systemic violence, but they can actively catalyze us all individually and collectively to take action, pushing us all to ask ourselves, what does this statement compel me to do? May it compel us to research histories, treaties, and native nations that should have jurisdiction of the lands they stewarded since time immemorial. May it compel us to be exact and forthcoming with our tangible obligations and actions to realize a decolonized future. May it compel us to support indigenous communities through donations and other resources. May it compel us to fight the, with the land back movements in our region, continent, and world. And I encourage you all to visit landback.org for more information. <laughs> the Watershed Graphic Novel Series grabs a hold of you and doesn't let go. It's an ongoing story that illuminates the cyclic nature of oppressive forces and the labor and love required to withstand and dismantle it all. The statement for Watershed reads, Watershed is a love and death story about America through the lens of race, a sweeping multi-volume account that merges non-fictional elements of history, culture, and current events with speculative fiction. You are invited along on the journey of Winnie Skye, who unwittingly finds herself directly and indirectly oscillating between three time periods, the unsettled past of this country's original sin, present day at the infancy of a new wave of the black liberation movement, and an uncertain dystopian future consumed by a questionable oligarchy. 
Thank you for everyone attending tonight to hear the publication team talk about this ongoing work. My name is Hannah Bakken Morris. I am the interim director for the Center for Contemporary Art and Culture here at PNCA. It's a very long-winded way of saying I run the galleries. <laughs> and it's my pleasure to help coordinate this exhibition and event. My unending gratitude to Melanie Stevens for being game to make an exhibition happen and being such a delight to work with. All of my praise and unrelenting compliments to Maximiliano for being the curator and admin support to make this all happen with such grace. Um, and to echo Maximiliano, thank you to Erne Winham, who's sitting here in the back, for being an all-star art handler and install tech. Yes, Maximilio is right, hire him for everything. <laughs> Um, and a big warm welcome to our panelists and moderator, whose bios I will now elucidate into a chorus. Sam Saxby, who we can see right now in full screen. <laughs> they, she, human, earthling, is a fiction writer and editor residing in Portland, Oregon. Sam is the development, devilla, development and copy editor for the graphic novel series Watershed, an editorial operations associate for Book Riot, and associate editor for Forest Avenue Press. They are writing their debut novel and have published work in Nailed magazine. Sam is always working to dismantle racism and gatekeeping in book publishing. Thank you, Sam, for attending. Sharita Town, who's also joining us in Zoom, uh, is the printer publisher of Watershed Volume 2. And she's a multidisciplinary artist and educator based in Portland, born and raised on the west coast of the US along Interstate 5 from Salem, Oregon to Tacoma, Washington, and down to Sacramento, California. She is most interested in engaging local and global black geographies, histories, and possibilities. In her work, a shared art penetrates and binds people, artists, audience, organizers, civic structures, sisters, cousins, and landscape in collective catharsis, grief, and joy. Thank you for joining us, Sharita. Vo, they, them, is our moderator tonight, <laughs> is a writer, speaker, curator, artist, and musician who's exhibited and toured in Australia, Germany, Indonesia, the Netherlands, Singapore, Croatia, Mexico, Finland, Denmark, New Zealand, Vietnam, Sweden, Malaysia, and the States. They primarily work in comics, textiles, embroidery, weaving, and furniture building to explore, explore support strategies and models of community care within a post-traumatic social landscape, focusing on the resilience of BIPOC, LGBTQI2S+, and disabled communities. Their latest publication is a graphic novel titled Trauma X, Holding Space Radically, published in late 2020. And last but not least, Melanie Stevens, the artist and author, is an artist and illustrator and writer. She's the creator of the graphic novel series Watershed and the co-founder and editor of Miss Anthology, an organization that supports and publishes racially and economically diverse young comic artists who identify as female or genderqueer. She's also the curator of Nat Turner Project, a migratory gallery space that grants artists of color, of color the freedom to create or express their own language within and without the parameters of racial commodification or designation. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree for political science from Yale University and her Master's of Fine Arts degree for visual studies at Pacific Northwest College of Art, where she currently teaches. So thank you. So with that, I'm going to hand the mics back to Vo and let this go. Thank you, Hannah. Um, thank you, Max, for their Grammy Award winning <laughs> thank you to everybody's speech. Loved it. Um, I'm just put, killing time while I put this mic on. Um, okay. Can you hear me okay, Zoom? Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so I, we, I know we did the kind of official written bio artist introduction, but I just want to make space for kind of any additional uh, comments about or uh, information about who you are, especially as it pertains to this realm. I know um, a few of you do things in different worlds, um, but in this specific uh, world, uh, if you want to kind of add any comments um, about who you are. And I noticed the three of you are very passionate about reducing gatekeeping in, in lots of different ways. And I just noticed the commonality in the three the three of your y'all's practice already um, in the way that you kind of work really hard to make things accessible for um, black folks, young folks, 
uh, people of color. So anyway, uh, Melanie, do you want to start if any extra intros? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, I guess I'll keep it brief by saying that I don't, I feel that my individual art practice is interwoven with my communal art practice. It, it has to be necessarily so. Um, so I am very interested in you know, doing my best to sort of contribute to leveling the, the, the landscape um, for artists of color um, and specifically black artists um, to sort of counteract, you know, the generations of like um, inequities and disparities, um, particularly within the arts, um, which is what I focus on, so. Awesome, thank you. Can you all hear okay? Yeah, cool. Uh, Sharita? Yeah, I do what Melanie just said too. <laughs> um, but what I'll add to it is one thing that really gives me joy uh, in doing that is um, I like to be an assistant. Uh, I like to just assist people in delegating their ambitions uh because i think a lot of amazing artists like melanie it's like they're they're both doing so much within their own practice and also affording so many other people opportunities and platforms in their own practices that um i think we we can run really complex uh dreams and projects and things and so i just like to assist people with that um so i don't always think of it as like gatekeeping or like kicking down a door like I I I often just think of it as like a day-to-day -day practice that I'm super grateful to get to witness of just seeing creativity unfold um, with certain artists thank you Sam um, I can definitely say that being someone coming from the underrepresented realm I feel like you know we always have to every it's a daily practice to be an agent for change. So I do have roots in independent publishing, traditional publishing, which is very racist and trying to, you know, dismantle that as much as possible, trying to make sure that there's room for everyone to have, you know, creative outlets and be able to be supported in those spaces and to have their voices heard. So yeah, it's pretty cool to be able to go back and forth between traditional book publishing and self-publishing, especially with graphic novel series, and I'm just happy to be a part of it. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, so Mel, for folks in the room who haven't had the pleasure of reading Watershed yet, maybe, mm -hmm. I overheard the description, a love and death story, and I heard the word America. <laughs> um, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, or any other... In insight you want to give? Um, yes, okay. So um, the tagline is a love and death st um, story about America through the lens of race and time. Um, I was very much inspired by the Octavia Butler novel Kindred and her use of time travel as this way of critiquing American culture and, uh, and, and American systems. Um, so I wanted to create a, a narrative that sort of utilizes this particular moment of time that we're in right now, um, specifically from like 2012 to like 2024, um, to sort of examine the ways in which there are these moments that have happened, that are happening, that could be considered watershed moments in history, right? Um, and what if the opportunity was afforded to change one of these moments? Would it change what's to come or, you know, would it, would it better kind of resolve the issues of the past? So I wanted to use like the graphic novel format to sort of tell that story, which is what Watershed um, is. Cool, um, thinking about that book, uh trying to remember when I read it, um, similarities are, you know, a lone female protagonist. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned love and labor before. So really that protagonist going through a lot of shit mm -hmm. to trying to, wh whilst trying to maybe correct those wrongs or yeah. um, adjust some stuff. Yeah. Um, 
but a lot of, yeah, labor, like brutal labor, right? Um, I think a question that came up for me just now was there's like the systemic and then there's the individual. Right. <laughs> yeah, how do you um, see them interplaying and especially maybe in context of your, of this, of this series of books? Yeah, thank you for that um, because I, I do think that oftentimes in these conversations of, you know, structural violence, um, people sort of conflate um, the systemic and the individual struggles. Um, and I wanted to use this narrative to kind of examine both of those things. Um, obviously, there are the very evident structural um, issues that are happening around the protagonist, Winnie Skye, um, with what's happening in the country and even what's happening in the institutions that she's associated with um, as an artist, as an art student, and later on, you know, um, professionally. But also, um, I wanted to explore her interpersonal relationships um, with people who maybe don't identify the same as her um, and the different paths that they're sort of forced to go through because of what's happening outside of them and how it affects them interpersonally. So, Are those people like stand-ins for different types of institutions? The people that are kind of, like you say, have slightly different sensibilities or approaches to these? I wouldn't say that they're stand-ins for institutions. Like Winnie, they are reflections of the institutions they're born of. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, her, the love interest that she starts with in Watershed One um, is born of a certain kind of privilege, and it's, it's reflected in the dialogue that they have um, and the different points at which they meet the institutions that they're a part of, so. Awesome, thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything to add around um, the systemic and the individual and interpersonal and the political? Well, I know especially with um, Winnie's, is it the art curator? Sorry, I'm not great with the terms, but yes. I, am I right? Okay, great. Yeah. The curator in both one and two and Winnie's interactions with them. And um, again, just speaking to the privilege, especially white privilege in the artist space, um, it's, pretty eye-opening, like it's something that, especially if you don't normally exist in the art world, to be able to recognize it and also have to reckon alongside Winnie with it and what the approach will be um, is very enlightening as far as the narrative is concerned. And like, it's something that Winnie has to deal with at home with Drew and something that Winnie's dealing also with in their professional endeavors. Totally, Sharita? I just, I guess I would say that as I, as I was listening to Melanie describe some of those things, it's interesting to almost um, like mirror some of those, I guess, challenges or things that one has to go through in the printing and distribution of something, you know, like you're thinking very much about how this object that will move through the world is going to move through those structures as well um and you know find its audience and people that are also navigating those things so just feeling very humbled to get to kind of hold and help birth the thing um and have that mirrored also to some degree through this protagonist story as well yeah thank you yeah for the for the audience like the the story has the overarching kind of epic storylines but then uh day to day you're seeing winnie experience these microcosms of larger institutions like the art world. Um, and the curator is uh, basically holds a white gaze and demands that Winnie adapts her work to the white gaze. And Winnie, you'll, I won't ruin it, yeah. you know, no spoilers. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, and so again, like how is that, you know, that may be mirrored in, like Sharita said, the kind of distribution and the creation and um, and the future creation of, of this series. Um, but it also speaks to how cyclical time is mm -hmm. and how you have these moments of repetition. Great segue to my next question. <laughs> so um, I heard the word cyclical earlier. And again, another question around narratives of progress. You know, some people see progress as linear. Some people see, especially around revolutions or resistance. Um, some people do see things as generational cycles. 
um, see some people see them as cycles that inch towards something like some kind of progress, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Just wondering again, it has your has your thinking changed over the time that you've made the first two books? Um, what do you, where do you stand at the moment around those thoughts? I would say that um, my personal idea of time has always been that it's this, you know, kind of endless like cycle going on and on and repeating itself over and over and over again. Um, I think at the beginning when I first started Watershed, I had in my head this idea of not necessarily linear, but like a very specific endpoint. And I think that um, as we go through things, um, I mean, it's been four years that has passed. Um, my ideas on how time functions and how it changes people um, have, I think, deepened. And I think that the end game for Watershed is going to be a lot more complex than I originally thought. Do you want to speak a little bit about hope versus yeah. other? Yeah. Um, I do kind of want to indirectly sort of address this idea of hope um, through the protagonist because it starts in 2012 um, and it will go on ostensibly um, for an unforeseen amount of time. And I do want, I want to explore this idea of what hope does and what the function of it is within the context of structural violence and how that idea of hope changes over time um, and what it means to people like me, you know. Um, so you know, I'm very interested in hope and this idea of progress and what that means and what that actually looks like and what, or whether or not that's kind of a construct that's thrown into the mix to deflect in some ways, so. Yeah, uh, totally. Um, speaking of change, do you, Will any change in the protagonist reflect change in you? Is there how much relationship is there between the protagonist and you? There's a, there are a few similarities. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, respectability politics is my next note. Oh. Um, but maybe I'll just I'll um, ask a specific question. Uh, a film I watched many many moons ago. Uh, See you yesterday. The kid, like the rocket scientist kid, and she oh. goes back in time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that had a really like specific, like very middle class or upper class sensibility. That that film. Mm -hmm. um, and there was like a particular respectability politic around that film. We won't have to talk. We don't have to talk about that film. But I think decisions by you around around yeah respect respectability or um, class or kind of other types of legibility. I mean, class is always baked in there, right? Like when you're talking about people, you're ostensibly talking about their positionality, where they are in life, what they have access to. So that's, I mean, it's interwoven throughout the story. And then I, I think that's another part of the change that we see in, in Winnie, like her ascension through different class systems, I think is something that I want to explore as well um, and what that does to her, so. Cool, and I might extend this question to Sam, if that's cool, in terms of, either class, respectability, or other things, like geography and character voice, mm -hmm. and editing for those different voices. Um, any thoughts or your experience in editing? Well, I know that we, we definitely get it in the first volume with Winnie's relationship with Drew, and then that kind of grows when you actually see Drew exist in the world of the art show. and how that unfolds, which no spoilers. Again, you just gotta go get it, go buy it. Thank you. Um, but then we also, in the second volume, we have um, the secondary character, Alicia, Winnie's friend, who has known Winnie since they were kids. So also to be able to have that evolution in, um, in the character and being able to get more of a sense of you know, um, class stance and being able to navigate those waters is is something that we very much try to 
make sure that it's authentic and really trying to suss out for the reader so that they can, you know, understand uh, the character's development there. And it's also something that I think we'll continue to see unfold as, you know, more issues come. Yeah, as a non-national foreigner myself, um, Alicia read geographically different to Winnie or they, they just had distinct voices. So I was yeah, wondering if you want to speak a little bit more to their distinction or their different, the, the way they distinguish from each other in, time, in terms of voice. Character voice is something that's very important to Melanie and myself, um, especially, especially um, being able to convey <laughs> early drafts, trying to convey that on the page before you even see the art. So it was a lot of going back and forth. And one of the, the things I like to do as an editor is I have the author read me passages of the work so I can get a sense of the voice as they hear it and then be making sure that my edits and my notes are staying true to that voice. So when Alicia first came on the scene and being able to first hear her, I was just kind of like, okay, so this sounds like a friend that I've had for quite some time, very personal to me. It's someone that I'm familiar with and being able to make those tweaks and changes like this is how I think that they would sound or this is more in line of what I think that they would say versus what we have. And then also making sure that when we're working with Michael, that's something that is continuous through the art. So not only do you have the visual of Alicia and Winnie and like just on site, okay, yeah, I can get a sense of how they would speak, but then to elevate it on the page. Um, I don't know. Like, how do we do it? We just do it. <laughs> we just make it work. <laughs> totally. And, and you're not that concerned with legibility, I'm assuming, or kind of adjusting to, you know, a white gaze or otherwise, right? Never. Never in life. That's what I was trying to get at. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Cool. Um, oh, I would just yeah. add one thing while we're on the topic of these two characters and the printing. Uh, it took like It took like two weeks to really make sure that Winnie's friend was the right <laughs> monochromatic skin tone. Like, like we used like we used like three or four different color profiles and each of them kind of kept collapsing both Winnie and her friend into a similar color and shade. And so it felt really important to make sure that they were colorized in on the page and the way that they were meant to in, in Melanie's eyes. Um, Cause I think that that's pretty, you know, there, there, it, it plays, it does something in the story and it will probably do more in the story. Um, so it's also interesting with ink and color to try to kind of make sure characters stay illuminated in the way that they're supposed to as well. Um, and, and that's both like, I mean, I think that we can talk about, um, you know, different diasporas and different things, but also just talking about colorism within the U.S. and this being a story about race in the U.S., it felt very important to spend those two weeks <laughs> keeping those characters the shade that they were meant to. That segues to my next question about the custom inks and the custom colors. Um, but, yeah, I, I think thank you for answering that in addition to, yeah, how those two characters are distinct. Um, I'm looking at volume two. I'm looking at black, magenta, and brown. Is that right? Uh, was that two full-time weeks that you used to calibrate that? <laughs> tell, no, tell us about how no. grueling the process was. Yeah, actually, it was so fun because, you know, we tried a bunch of different color combinations based on the Riso drums that I have. And anyone in the audience or in the future internet that doesn't know what Risograph is, because it will soon die as a printing medium, <laughs> um, Risograph is a mixture between kind of Xerox and screen printing. So it's real paper, or sorry, real ink on paper. It's soy based and rice bran oil ink. Um, and you basically have, I have now 30 drums, but at the time we printed this book, I had like 12 or something like that. And so when we tried to do a black spot color for this, for this pub publication and the fluorescent pink, we weren't hitting the midtones in the way that we wanted to. And so we had to basically hack. I mean, risograph is always a hacked printed medium. Uh, so we had to crack open two tubes of ink. One tube of ink was called orchid 
and the other tube of ink was fluorescent pink and we had to mix them together uh, and we named the color rhododendron because that was actually the flower that Melanie based the spot color on. So I liked that. I liked that kind of poetic that we picked a color named after a flower, named after orchid, and then essentially what might be the most exciting color in the Risa world, <laughs> fluorescent pink, fight me. Anyways, so we mixed those two colors together and we made rhododendron and we shortened the name to the roadie drum. We called it roadie. And so I would go into the shop and I would talk to John. I'd be like, how's the roadie drum doing? You know, how's roadie like, how's roadie in this particular character and, and whatnot. So that was fun. And then the other custom color that we made, this was fun. Uh, I remember writing Melanie, well, I would drive, I would print stuff and then I would drive to Melanie's house. And this was like in the midst of the pandemic and like put pages on the porch and like see how those colors were working, you know, if they, if they were hitting in the way that she wanted to. Uh, and so we had to mix for the, the brown spot color in this book, we had to mix Riso brown and then we had to mix Riso white. So the brown has a clear, I'm sorry, if anyone in the audience is like, why is she still talking about color? I promise it's almost done. I promise <laughs> it's almost done. So we had to mix uh, like a transparent based brown ink and then like a white based white ink together. So it, it came out very, like it, it looked like pudding. It just looked like pudding. And so I was trying to think of different names, like what's this custom color gonna be, you know? And I was like, I don't know, how about chocolate? And Melanie was like, absolutely not, go die. There's no way in which we will call this custom color chocolate. And I was like, totally, totally, totally. And so I was like, what do you want to call this custom color? And she was like, Donna Summers. And I was like, party. So for the rest, like basically Watershed, I'm, I'm almost done. Watershed has helped me establish that in my shop, anytime I mix a custom color, it's either going to be after a flower or a black femme uh, performer like all the custom colors will be named in those ways henceforth as it, uh, should, be. As it should be so <laughs> that's all I'll say is it was just such a labor of love to make sure that you know this this um this object that we want to kind of pursue that's about time and we want to exist through time would have you know just like a, a really particular kind of quality and timber and tone in in the colors and from page to page such a labor of love that speaks to the folks that you have coming in on this project and the fact that, you know, none of us are white <laughs> and we're very much putting in the deserved time and attention into the color, the voice, the look of these characters and, you know, making sure that things are just authentic to. Yeah, the, the three of y'all, Mike and Donna Summers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I can't imagine you know, uh, a printing collaboration or an editing co editing collaboration, which like the editor is like, this vo this these voices don't sound like two friends talking to each other who have known e to each other for a long time. I can't imagine another printer who would pick up on the nuances that one character's dark skinned and one character's light skinned, and the the printing needs to reflect that. Like, so I feel grateful for both of you and Mike, who can't be here, uh, as well for just like inherently understanding the things that I'm trying to get through in this graphic novel um, that I would have to have like long drawn out explanations for otherwise. So just I'm just holding a moment for this tenderness, this tender appreciation. But yeah, totally. Yeah. <sighs> um, color, Sharita, it's not over for the Rezo nerds. I have another question. Yeah. For anyone that's tried to print a book on uh, a, print, a risograph printer. How was the registration? How, how long did it take to get, you know, the things kind of lined up? Yeah, you know, it was a trip. Let me just say that. It was a trip. It was, it often doesn't work the way it, it's supposed to. And again, like I, in re-nerding out on this process and rereading the story again, um, I was like, wow, this does, I do feel like Winnie. <laughs> like, I can't get it right. <laughs> like, it's not working out, you know. Uh, it took a lot to re register it in the way that it needed to, front and back. And then on the spreads that are both spot colors, both the, ro the rhododendron and the Donna Summer and the black, like that had to take two passes through the machine. 
And so, yeah, there was just a lot of hours over our machine uh, at the studio. It was really a lot. Our machine is named Mr. Um, and that's after Billie Holiday's dog, Mr., the boxer. Um, and so just lots of like kind of petting Mr. And be like, come through, friend, come through. You know, it was a lot. It was a lot. Yeah, I'm just reflecting on how much labor this is because because self-publishing, because we want to, because controlling our own production, because, so yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple other questions, but does anyone have any questions for, sorry, Sam and Sharita, do you have any follow-up questions for Melanie before I ask a couple more? I think so. Okay. Um, maybe we'll ask two more and then we'll open to uh, Q&A. Cool. Um, mm, pop, pop culture? So maybe um, absolutely Octavia, Octavia Butler, but also maybe a little bit Back to the Future? A little bit? <laughs> no, no. I can neither confirm Qua nor deny Quantum that. leap, quantum leap, <laughs> if anything. If anything... <laughs> Quantum leap. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's different. How dare I spiel, Spielberg? <laughs> like, sorry. Okay. You neither confirm or deny. Is that yeah. the answer? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a flux capacitor in, the, in <laughs> book number three? <laughs> okay. Um, other pop culture, like maybe subconsciously or just below consciously? I mean, not just subconsciously. Like, you know, I think all graphic novel artists, um, I think Liz maybe can speak to this, we like to throw Easter eggs in, in the background and see if people pick up on that. So like there are a bunch of like pop culture Easter eggs thrown throughout like literature, like um, you know, music, that sort of thing. Yeah, so it's in there. Cool, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I was and just it's thinking. something we keep an eye on even in the art and the edits because I'll be like, I see the stack of books in the background <laughs> with these titles. Interesting, <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> cool. And then speaking of editing in terms of even format or um, narrative or kind of structure, do you, if you, do you also look out for that if it, if it starts to look a little too familiar or if it does remind you of a pop culture reference? I try to. I try and be cognizant of that. And then even like looking at um, Winnie's choice in clothing and a lot of things that'll be written on Winnie's shirt and just being like, all right, this is on the nose. But also in this frame, there's something in the text, it says that something's blocking it. So I shouldn't be able to see the upper half of the shirt and then having to make sure that the art reflects that. Totally. Yeah. Winnie's t-shirts are worth the read if, you know, um, yeah. Um, Okay, uh, do you want to talk about number zero? Yeah. Okay. What about it? Uh, tell us about it. <laughs> so this, we have one, we have two. Yeah, so there have been two volumes. Um, eventually there will be a total of ten. Um, the next one coming out is volume zero. Um, and it's basically kind of... Um, backstory or exposition about one of the more um, mysterious characters um, in, in these books. It's volume zero because it's not meant to be like a prequel or a sequel. It's more of an interstitial, inter interstitial that's meant to be read anywhere um, on this journey. Um, so yeah, and that's coming out ostensibly next year, um, if I ever get time <laughs> to make it, so. Time. Time. Time is a privilege. Um, I, I kind of have had a follow-up question to Colors, but, I, but you don't have to answer this. No, I can answer um, I'm always interested in, like, social or conceptual indicators of color. And, uh, you know, obviously you have chosen color to code different times, speaking of time. Um, do you want to tell us more about that, or do you want to keep it mysterious? Um, I will say that each of the volumes is monochromatic. Um, they're all brown um, for the dream sequences um, that are woven throughout, but during the narrative um, parts of it, um, they each have their own color. Volume one was blue, um, volume two was rhododendron, um, and so on and so forth. So like each color 
does kind of signify something, but yeah. And that's personal. Yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> Let's dive um, into the brown with the hooded figure. <laughs> what hooded figure? <laughs> or just the figure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm excited to find out more about her next year sometime. <laughs> um, okay, last question for me. Uh, the name of the exhibition this time? Yes. Is that sarcastic? Is that, what, what, did, what do you mean by this time? This time, um, it's a reference to kind of a, a repeated refrain that happens in both books at, at certain junctures. And, you know, it, it kind of alludes to this idea that can, like, can, t can we possess time? Can it belong to us at any point? Is, is there a moment that we can change, um, you know, the course of things? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought of it as cycles and, like, this time. Mm-hmm. Dot, dot, dot. Um, but also about social amnesia and abolition mm. and all of those things. So I, was, I wasn't sure if it was playful or, or jaded or hopeful or, you know. Maybe all of the things. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> all righty. Um, anything else that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to share with people? I mean, read it. Um, I think it's a, it's a good read. Um, and, you know, the, the idea that, you know, I, I have this opportunity to self-publish a graphic novel series is, like, I feel just really grateful for that. And I, I feel honored to be able to work with Sharita and Sam and Mike Lancet, who can't be with us today. Um, and ostensibly, I will continue to work with them um, through to the end of this. So, yeah. The books are incredibly powerful. I, it's just a given, but in case people didn't understand that, they're incredibly powerful. Thank you. Um, and, you know, f first reading them four years ago mm -hmm. and then reading them again, you know, now. And, um, and again, that's why I'm just, I'm so curious about what moments in time we'll be capturing every time we read them or every time a new one comes out. I'm, I'm, it's kind of an exciting game, you know. Yeah. Um, but it also forces us to reflect on kinds of the failures of, of the last several years as well. Um, but, but beyond that, what you've made is, yeah, incredible and, like, thrilling and, like, titillating and exciting. And, and then beyond the story and, and your creation, them as a physical product that both Sam and Sharita have had a hand in making exist, I'm just so glad that they exist as, as things in the world. So, yeah, totally. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So maybe 15 minutes for questions, Q&A. So yeah, wondering if anyone has any comments, feedback, feelings, responses or questions. David and then, yep, go ahead. Oh, should I be passing the mic around for the recording? Yes. I can hear it pretty you good. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Or, okay. I just, I'm, getting, I'm getting the mic. Step up to the mic. Uh, okay. Um, so, Sam, Sharita, Melanie, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I have an inquiry about this idea of dismantlement that you were speaking of earlier, the three of you. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. This book is by Fred Moten. Uh, Under Commons is something I've been rereading yes. recently. And essentially this idea of comics and the ability to sort of share and give it to like, let's say a much wider community. But like, I guess I'm just curious of sort of why comics as a medium, I mean, in some sense, right? Like, do you feel the white gallery would be accessible or be looking at these comics, right? I mean, you might be reaching these students and people here or maybe being a teacher and sort of maybe inside dismantling that way. But in the long term, is that something that you have different plans for or strategies or is that something you care about? Curious on your thoughts on that. Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I will preface this by saying that I am sort of biased um, because I view comics as this sort of um, kind of accessible way to um, pass on difficult information um, just because of the, like, the very nature of the medium it presents as like innocuous, um, childlike almost. Um, but also I enjoy the accessibility of production of comics. Um, 
you know, I, before I went back to art school um, to become an artist, um, I spent nights and weekends, you know, doing web comics and working on comics with my friends. And like, we were able to like distribute these things like into the world with, with no overhead, no money. Um, and I, I, there's always been a place in my heart for comics um, as a medium in that way of like subverting, um, you know, these very structured, very violent, um, uh, sort of like um, uh, boundaries that we have as artists. Um, so I always kind of return to that. And also, I mean, in terms of like being able to convey a full-bodied narrative, uh, like comics for me are unmatched in that way. Um, so, yeah. Even film? I don't have the skill set for film. <laughs> that, that was another question I forgot to ask, which is, to me, this reads as really filmic. Do you think in yeah. filmic terms? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it, 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 it feels like that. And yeah. that's, there's a strength in that, too. Yeah. Cool. Derek? Uh, so, do you mind if I sit next to you? Please. Uh, so, when I think of time travel, right, I think it's like a, it's like a zany. They, people have done it where it's serious. Why use time travel? And also the other part of that question is like, when I think of time travel, I think of inevitability and not hope and not change. Can you also talk about that? So you mean determinism? Yeah. Gotcha, versus free will. Just a simple topic <laughs> to cover. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so if the first part, why use time travel? Um, and not to be a smart ass, but why not? <laughs> like, um, yeah, thanks, Derek. I just, I, 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 like, I really can't think of any better vehicle than time travel with which to critique society because, you know, we are different people in different moments and, like, our ideas of what has been and what is and what is going to be are constantly in flux. They're constantly changing. I think... Personally, I think when we go back and like we look at something that has happened and we evaluate it through the lens in which we now stand, I view that as a kind of time travel, honestly. Um, so to that end, like, why not turn it into this kind of like piece of speculative fiction um, in which we can, we can like look at what we may have had the ability to change. Or may not. Yeah, and I think the the way that it holds a mirror, you know, to current and pre re recent events is just eerie. It's uncanny, right? And yeah. so, it to me, the time travel uh, mechanism kind of adds to that like uh, overarching epic effect of wow, like how did how did Melanie know? <laughs> so so prescient. But um, yeah. Uh, Thank and then you. the hope thing. The hope. Oh thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, go, go. Um, and I invite uh, Sam and Sharita to chime in on this. I guess. Um, I will. I will say, like, to contextualize this, um, I started writing this after November 2016. Um, so by then, my ideas of like hope had already frayed. Um, but there was still a little bit left there, like some uh, remnant of like this idea that, you know, oh, some of this can be salvaged maybe. Um, but I think Watershed in some ways is me kind of working through that and grieving the loss of that um, and coming to this point of acceptance of how hope or the idea of hope has ultimately been, been quite destructive in very real ways, so. Sam, Sharita. I was thinking about both questions because I, especially coming from, I don't have a comics background. So coming into this project and when I first learned that we were dealing with multiple time periods and things, it became more digestible to approach that via comics because you also have the added element of the art Whereas if we were coming at this as the traditional 
narrative, no art, all words, that would be quite the project to be able to oscillate between different timelines and make sure that everything is still um, being portrayed in a way that, you know, folks can still keep with the narrative and also still stay interested. Um, and then when I think of hope as far as watershed, I mean, we come from a people that are very resilient. And I think that this entire graphic novel series definitely emulates that and keeps that alive. I mean, I know we can't get into the, the figure too much, but I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> Can you uh, can you rephrase the question for me again so I don't ramble and figure out way too hard? Yeah. Um, the the cue was time travel sometimes denotes sorry connotes um, inevitability rather than hope. What do you think about that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, part of me wants to push back on it a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that there's something about, I think in this particular time travel, when I think about blackness and black collectivity and black life and time travel, um, and in this particular, like in a personal way, um, just things I'm ha that are happening in my own family right now, intergenerational stuff, just very big on grief uh, and how one death or one loss in a black family or a black community can be felt in this way that is ripples across time, right? And it, it ripples. And, but there's something there that um, I resist as this kind of inevitability or in, yeah, inevitability of like just the grief. Uh, there's something about fighting against it and really um, just kind of wanting certain kinds of answers and inquiry and understanding. Like to me, the hope isn't that like somebody might stay alive or that something whatever but the hope is in actually understanding and breaking down those systems uh and so i think i feel you know a, you know winnie's character resounds with me with a certain kind of tirelessness in wanting to know and to me even though it can be a dark knowing there's still hope in that Whew. thank you yeah so i heard grieving the deterioration or maybe the curtain falling away around how hope is weaponized. I heard resilience from Sam and, and um, yeah, kind of the, the, yeah, the tool of cultural resilience. And then I heard, um, yeah, what, what Shreya just said, I don't have to recap it, but um, no, I appreciate the, the, the different and the depth of uh, responses. Um, do you have anything else to add? Okay, awesome. Wow, this is great. Um, one more question. Go ahead. How did you land on this medium and how did you land on Rezo specifically? Um, okay, so how I landed on this medium to, to tell the story is, um, I remember being really angry about the term microaggressions um, and how stupid that word sounds to me. Um, and I wanted to, like I had this like dream sequence in my head. Um, of a black woman drowning in a sea alone, surrounded by white people who either don't see her or don't acknowledge that she's drowning. Um, so I wanted to do something around that, but I felt that it, need, it needed several like iterations, several like scenes or panels or whatever. Um, so I decided to um, 
create that story in comic form. And that, that is essentially what kind of piloted the idea of Watershed. Um, so yeah, that, what was the second part of that question? Oh. Rizzo. Rizzo, okay, well, um, I think Sharita will have to answer the second part <laughs> of that. But like, the, the first part of that, like why Rizzo is like, well, I knew Sharita, Sharita had a Rizzo like press. And Sharita was like, hey, do you want to do Watershed Volume 2 in Rizzo? And I was like, of course. Is that a thing that we can do? So I said yes, because I, I mean, I love Rizzo Graph. I think it's beautiful. Um, just like under no like circumstance would I have uh, would I have ever imagined that me who's this kind of like unknown comic artist could have an entire comic in risograph form like that's incredible to me so of course I'd like jumped at the chance at that so um, add on question from webcomic to physical to Rizzo mm -hmm. the the kind of how do you feel about you know a printed object in the world, a Rezo printed object in the world versus an online comic? Uh, yeah, web comics are much like quicker. Um, the tone, I think, is more irreverent, less precious. It's, it's different having these objects out in the world, right? Like um, having these books that people can, ha can like obtain and collect. It's just a different thing. It's a different animal. And Sharita, who made this so precious yeah. yeah right any anything to add i just okay listen 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 so when i read the first copy and also uh when melanie was forming this book i had the privilege of getting to meet with her once a week and soundboard her art in general you know so i i felt like a a closeness while also a distance because I have like a cute spoiler alert. I like squint during previews and stuff. So I was just like, keep it away, keep it away because I want to hold the book, you know? And so once I did that Watershed 1 and I noticed that it was monochromatic, you know, that it ended up being two different monochromatic things, I was like, oh man, this thing is made for Riso, like just a two spot color print. And because of time and the graininess of Riso and also the weird expired technology, this weird fleeting moment of it. I was just like, ah, I have to have it. <laughs> I was so excited. And so when Melanie was like, yeah, I was like, oh God, I can't wait. Um, anyways, that's all. Yeah, and inside I was like, does Sharita know what she just signed up for? <laughs> she didn't. She did not know. She didn't know. Follow up question, Sharita. I think also the, your decision to go that way just amplifies the plot just before yeah. you even get into actually reading the words and you just looking at it and looking at the print style and the colors that y'all chose like you are definitely going into a whole other world and it's just like immediately hits you and sucks you in um i had a follow-up question but i i forgot it sorry it was for sharita oh, um hannah is it a question or is it okay cool yeah. uh, The question was uh, curatorial decisions around uh, which panels or pages to include in the exhibition that's currently up. Well, I'd just like to preface this by saying that Maximiliano is just a really thoughtful and um, like considered, considerate like curator, like one of the best that I've ever worked with. And I'm not just saying that because I work with him in other capacities, but like. Um, but we like sat down and had a discussion on what we wanted the exhibition to be. And the idea of having a graphic novel in a white gallery space and like what parts of the white cube gallery do we want to retain and what parts do we want to get rid of. Um, we also worked with Erne. Um, and we decided overall that like, well, I, I, what I was interested in is I wanted people to see a little bit more behind the process of making comics because I think 
I don't think people understand how much work it is. <laughs> um, but also I wanted there to be like a reading space for people to actually sit with the work. Um, so, I mean, those were the two most important parts of it for me. Um, and with that, uh, Maximiliano and I went in to that with those priorities in mind. Um, so the um, pages and the panels that we chose, um, uh, we chose different um, parts of that process from like the sketches to the inks to like the full blown colored pages, so. Um, and there was a question about scale as well. Yeah, I, I mean, um, the scale really came down to like what we had room in, like what, 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 like how much space we had in the room to showcase, so. Cool. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm curious, when you show process, is that to do with like demystification? Yes. Um, I, I, I just, I feel that because comics are like so there already, like this final finished product, people take for granted like all of the conceptual work and the ideation that goes into making a comic. Like, you know, from the writing to the rewriting to like um, thumbnails and sketches and inks and colors and then adding the actual copy. Um, it's, 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 a, it's a very involved process and I always appreciate, the comic shows that I've seen in gallery spaces, I've appreciated when they've taken the time to sort of break down you know, the trans and show the transparency behind like what goes into making a comic. Yeah, I appreciate the world building in these two uh, books as well. Uh -huh. um, you immediately kind of understand the world that Winnie is in yeah. as soon as you open the page. Yeah. Cool. I think we are at time, um, but thank you for the questions and thank you so much, um, Sam and Sharita, for beaming in from the ether. <laughs> it's really nice to see your faces. And thank you, last but not least, to Melanie Stevens. Um, thank you for making amazing art. And if you haven't seen the show down the hall, please check it out. Cool. Go buy copies, all the copies for coming up on holidays. Buy them for your friends and family. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, take care. <laughs>